Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today at our Activation Masterclass webinar. So this is actually a first of a series of Customer Lifecycle Metrics Masterclass that we are planning to run to help you build your analytics strategy. So before we get started, I will just share some housekeeping notes with you. So if you have any questions, please drop your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, we have some of our colleagues, Veronica and Shalina, here to help you answer any question that you may have. And we'll also have a Q&A session right at the end um, to answer more questions. We will be recording this full session, so and we'll be sending the slides and a recording to you after this. So don't worry too much about helping, helping to take notes. So um, to kickstart this webinar, I'm excited to introduce to you our speaker and instructor for today, Kirby Chua, who is our Principal Solutions Architect at Mixpanel. Kirby works with Mixpanel customers all across APEC to drive sustainable growth for their business through product analytics data. And he has consulted many product teams around creating scalable analytics strategies to help them deeply understand their user behavior, um, as well as to help them drive data informed business decisions. So Kirby has prepared many nuggets of information and wisdom for you today. So without further ado, I will pass the time off to Kirby. Thanks, Shiting. Yeah, hey, nice to meet everyone. I think we have a great crowd here today and uh, happy to be here to impart. So I wouldn't say I'm a teacher or what, but I'm just sharing my knowledge here. So happy to go through um, this whole series of activation masterclass. So just kind of like quickly going through our agenda for today. Um, we'll kind of like talk through a bit of why analytics strategy is important to you um, as a product manager, as well as your entire team uh, is behind your entire business. We'll talk through about metrics and measurements framework, and we'll definitely deep dive into the activation metric itself. At the towards the end of this uh, webinar, we'll have some additional resources that Yiting will share with you all, as well as um, a time for about a bit of a Q&A. But like Yiting said, um, don't be shy, just drop your questions in the Q&A. We have um, my colleagues, a great team here who's um, helping to answer some of your questions, um, you know, just as along the way. All right, so let's kind of like dive in. Um, let's think, talk about a little bit about the analytics strategy and why is it important before we kind of dive into the activation metric itself. So mixed panel has, we've been doing like this survey for you know, a couple of years now, and this was the last survey that we did. Um, and this took about 500 product leaders across um, the globe. And we've kind of like found out that, you know, most of the product managers are actually having a challenge to understand what is their users trying to do within their product? They're struggling in terms of the impact that they, the feature that they launched they have. And if you look at this, all these numbers here, right? Like just comfortably, like 50% among all the product managers that we've kind of like surveyed, they really can't get answers out of their product questions, right? And like, and, and you kind of like be puzzled, right? Like, cause like, hey, isn't product management, especially in APAC, even though we are much more later than um, the US and the EU counterpart, but we're still kind of like lagging behind, but it's still 50%. So our objective here is to really like impart our knowledge as, as mixed panel and, and be able to impart that knowledge that you have managers and product teams would be able to understand how you should measure your metrics and improve that experience for users, All right? Okay, so just taking a quick pause there. And when we talk about why analytics strategy is important and we talked about 50% of product managers right, can't get the answers that they want out of their product features and app. Um, if I kind of like ask a broad general question to all the folks that are on the call right now, and the question would be like, what do you think a product manager wants to do at the end of the day, right? In relation to analytics strategy, and the chat is open. Um, definitely drop your um, you know, thoughts uh, in the chat. I'm just you know, happy to hear the thoughts that you know, the people in the audience here. Okay, I see ROI of the features. Okay, any other thoughts from folks? On a day-to-day -day basis, look at product health. That's great. Day one retention of features, good. Prove progress, okay. Definitely, we definitely want to prove progress as product manager. Decision-making investment in the future, yes, that's definitely one of the things 
Data-driven decision, yes, great. Identify drops off, yeah, that's a very important um, part of product management. Is product actually solving problem? That's a good quote. Okay, product enhancement, cool. User acceptance percentage. All right, cool. Thanks for all those thoughts. And, and one of the quote actually uh, from Sunny Garg actually caught my attention. It says, is product actually solving problem, right? So if I were to kind of like collapse all your comments, engagement metric, user acceptance percentage, um, identifying drop-offs, um, things like being data-driven in your decision, future features and products, if you all boil that down into one single point, essentially every product manager um, in the day, day to day basis, they just want to build product that customers find value, right? Like obviously if, if your product doesn't bring value to your customers, um, the moment they install the app, they try it out, they probably uninstall it, the you know, like uh, that very moment. So, and to achieve having a product analytic strategy, it's, it's literally essential to measuring what in the world is this value, right? That your product brings. And with that value, are your customers or your users willing to exchange something or to sacrifice something in exchange for that value, right? So I'm just gonna take a very simple example from DocuSign, right? DocuSign in the, in the past where if DocuSign didn't exist, people would actually sign on contracts manually on a piece of paper. Um, for those that probably are old as, as I do, like we would actually fax that paper to our counterpart. Our counterpart would actually print it out, cross sign, fax it back to us. And at the end of the day, you get these two sort of original copies, right? Uh, that we deem to be contracts and, and the original contracts. Right? And when DocuSign came in, they literally revolutionized that contract signing process. And essentially the value that they bring to their users is the convenience of being able to execute contracts without having to go through all these nuances about signing, faxing, and, and, and kind of like printing out the piece of paper. And because of that convenience, customers, corporates, uh, same thing for Mixpanel, we use DocuSign and we subscribe to that because we want convenience um, in order to execute contracts, right? So that's, that's essentially, um, why we are here today is every product manager wants to be able to find the value for the product that the customer wants to willing to exchange something for that value. And so, okay, let's kind of like dive in a bit, a bit in terms of metrics and, and measurement frameworks, right? So we talk about value, we talk about why product managers and what you want to do at the end of the day. And with, you know, frameworks out there, um, product managers, I mean, they do adopt different frameworks. One of the common one is called the pirate framework. And there's a lot of them like Google Heart has one, there's like growth loops, lean analytics, mixed panel, we have the focus metric. I think at the end of the day, in, in my kind of like personal opinion, when it comes to all these frameworks, there's, there's honestly no right and wrong framework, right? Depending on where your product is and what stage are you in, you would be adopting certain framework that works for your business as well as for your app. But what I wanted to point out here in terms of framework is that make sure that as you adopt a framework that your whole team is aligned towards that framework, right? And, and the metrics that you define inside, which is one of the metric that we'll be discussing today is, is the activation metric, okay? All right, so thinking about framework and thinking about metrics, right? These are some of the things that we recommend in terms of how you actually would define and craft your metrics and KPI. Again, these are no brainers. I'm not gonna go through like, what's the meaning of being meaningful, measurable, manageable. But one thing I, I tend to kind of like um, realize from most of product managers is that they, they would tend to define meaningful, measurable, manageable, and, and time-bound metrics. But something that um, I may, if I impart my experience is that, uh, you need to also define your metrics to be movable. And, and what does movable mean? Movable essentially means that should you define a metric that is not movable, that means that you can't do anything or execute any action that would allow it to move from a certain state to a higher state, then that's probably not a good metric to have, right? Because with any metric, you will want to be able to move it in the direction that you want um, that metric to be. Right, so just you know, going through that, some um, common ideas. Um, and the second thing is that when you craft your cap metrics and KPIs, these are some high-level thoughts that you may want to look into. Um, things like focus on the value metrics rather than the vanity metrics. Right, so vanity metrics 
tend to be focusing on things like, oh, number of downloads, right? But you don't know actually what's going on with those downloads. Whereas if you measure value uh, metrics, you would look at what are the downloads that results to um, actions that the users are taking, right? So lagging metrics, revenue, um, versus a leading metric where the orders, the number of orders and the users are uh, ordering them, um, business metrics versus user metrics, as well as try to avoid manipulable metrics. Definitely uh, when you write, craft your metrics, focus on the measurement framework that you have and depending on, on the different metrics that is there, um, define them accordingly, okay? So just wanted to quickly get that out of the way um, as a quick sort of overview to set the stage um, before we kind of like jump into the um, you know, discussion per se, which is the activation metric. Cool. All right. So when you think of activation as part of a customer life cycle, right? Um, um, and this is um, something that Mixed Panel, um, our focus metric wants to impart in terms of we have focus metric, we have reach, we have activation, engagement, and retention. If you think about activation, it's literally sitting between your reach, which is your acquisition, so to speak, right? You acquire users, you bring them into your, uh, whether it's your website or your app, and literally activation is sitting in between from those users that have been acquired to them becoming engaged and becoming a retained customer uh, moving forward, right? So we always talk about activation being a bridge that takes your users from the moment in time you're marketing with all the campaign money that you spend, with all the tons of uh, Google ads and whatever that you spend to bring that customer in. The key is literally the activation piece. How do you get users from that state of knowing that your app exists to a state that they actually love your app and that they will continue to use your app and become a retained user coming back again and again um, to use your uh, application or website, right? So, and activation is literally the only metric that touches 100% of your acquired user, right? If you look at engagement, retention, um, most likely it won't be 100% of your acquired user, but activation literally sits just after reach, which is your acquisition. And, and basically every single user, you, you got to make sure that most of them, if not 100%, gets activated so that there is a chance for them to be engaged and retained, right? Um, activation is also showing the first impression about your users, uh, about your product to your users, right? If you don't do your activation properly, the first impression that the user has, you probably like say, oh, okay, yeah, this app is so-so, I don't like it, let me uninstall it. And with the day and age now, um, you know, people like install apps, you know, on a daily basis, tons of apps are being created. You know, people are so bombarded with a ton of apps. Your app in that drop of ocean needs to kind of like sound like a, a loud gong to make sure that that user to see the, va the value of your app and continues to use your app. Yeah, so activation is very important and with, and with, across with any metric, right? Because it's literally, again, the bridge between acquisition into your engagement. Cool. All right, so taking a look about activation, right? And we talk about what's the value of your product, right? And we've talked about the, the example of DocuSign. If you think about it, if I were to replace DocuSign out of this world, let's say I, I, I totally shut down the company of DocuSign, I bought it and I shut it down, right? If DocuSign didn't exist, people would go back to the archaic world of doing that contract again, faxing, maybe nowadays, the fax doesn't exist, they'll probably email, right? But literally, the value, your product's value moment is if you were think about it, you take out your entire product from the ecosystem, what would the user be doing in, ex in replacement of your product? That's actually your product value moment. And with that, with, it will be the key actions that they are doing that's actually the value that your product brings, right? So for DocuSign, the key actions that they'll be doing is literally executing a contract or signing for a contract. So that's the key action to measure the value of DocuSign's product. With that key action, there always comes what we call a natural frequency, right? So when you talk about natural frequency, what in the world is natural frequency, right? Every product has their own natural frequency. For DocuSign in their case, um, across the board on average, they kind of expect users 
uh, or customers that they have to sign contracts on a monthly basis, right? Obviously, they would have large customers, they would have smaller customers that probably does it daily or probably do it yearly, right? But in general, on average, they expect customers to sign contracts on a monthly basis. Um, obviously, for other solutions like maybe WhatsApp, right? They, they don't expect users to be using their app only on a monthly basis, right? It, this, they would expect the users to be using their app on a daily basis. That's the natural frequency. And natural frequency essentially is the same thing. You take your app out of the ecosystem. What would be the frequency that your user will be doing those key actions, which is your product's value? Um, would it be daily? Would it be monthly? Or would it be weekly, right? And so with key actions and with the natural frequency um, you know, defined, we need to also understand who is our target persona, right? Because uh, let me give you an example. I, I believe everyone knows about Grab, right? In APAC, Grab is pretty uh, you know, popular here. I mean, Uber is another one where in, in the Europe and the USI, they're more popular. Um, Uber and Grab actually have two different target personas, right? They have the riders and they actually have the drivers. Right, so the natural frequency and the key action of each of those personas would be actually different. So if you combine those three, your key action, which is your value of your product, the natural frequency of that action um, being taken, as well as your target persona, that literally defines your active users. Right? So I'm pretty sure most of the product managers here are not you know, are, are pretty familiar with DAUs, MAUs, WAUs, which kind of like measure your active users, right? Uh, and whatever that key action is. Always make sure, um, I have a lot of customers that always comes to me, hey, Kirby, um, uh, does DAU or WAU or monthly AU simply taking all my events? And then I slap that in and then I say, okay, what's the daily active users? Actually, it's not, right? Remember, your key act, you need to measure DAU, WAU, and monthly active user or MAU based on the key action that brings value for your users, not in terms of like just all your events, right? So um, because all your events could include like just the user logging in or just the user opening up the app, right? It triggers one event. So it must be a key action in the case of DocuSign, it's literally signing for a contract. Um, in Mixpanel, we um, recommend that this should be set as your focus metric. And it's kind of like an umbrella across all your different metrics, activation, engagement, and retention. And at the same time, we also tend to recommend that uh, that should just be an overarching measure of your health as a bis uh, in the business, but it should not be the end state, right? Because you may be running a, lot, a ton of ac uh, acquisition and your active users may be like going up. But if your retained users and engaged users are going down, the tendency that once your campaigns go down, your active users will go down, right? So we always advise um, customers that, yes, it's good to measure um, active users, DAU, WAU, or MAU, but always make sure that you have subsequent level one metrics such as activation, engagement, and retention to support that active usage, right? And so make sure you monitor those as well. All right. So with that, um, just want to open um, to the audience here in terms of um, the active users in your own industry, maybe just share a bit, what do you think would be your key action, your natural frequency and the target persona? And we'll just take a, a few moments to kind of like note that down. I'll kind of like type that here into the, into the um, sort of edit box here. Any volunteers? So you can type in the chat, maybe your industry, your key action, your natural frequency, and your target persona. And then we kind of like say, um, kind of like do that as a workshop in terms of this is your focus metric. Okay, we have social platform. Okay, and you have updating watch list daily as your uh, key action. And your natural frequency is daily. And your target persona would be investor and trader, okay? Okay, so probably you would have like, this will be your D, uh, maybe watch list, daily watch list update. Or we'll just do uh, trader, something like that. Okay, you have SAS as well. 
and your key actions is sharing your content on a daily basis. Okay, that's good. Making rent payment. Okay. Okay, investment, fintech, daily HNI and retail. What does uh, maybe Sunny want to elaborate? Like, what does HNI and uh, mean? EdTech, okay, students who have visited the journey page and taken action frequency daily. Interesting, we have a dance platform uh, that's okay, streaming of classes on a daily basis. E-commerce purchase. Okay, thanks. Thanks for all those sharing. Recruitment, placing a candidate in a job, okay, on a weekly basis. Okay, you have e-commerce add to cart twice a week. And so that would be like uh, weekly active users instead of daily active users, yeah? Uh, for the e-commerce, okay. You have digital banking, transfer, pay, top up of savings, and your natural frequency will be daily or weekly, target personas and user. Okay, and you have learning development, reading. Okay, so I'm just gonna try to summarize all this. So all very good points. Um, one, one caution about, uh, I've saw some of the, the comments here in terms of like, um, say, let me just kind of like pick on one here that I've seen so far. So when you define your actions, right? So don't just say has taken an action. So you must make sure that you know what the action is that brings value. So example in, in ed tech space, typically I do see that the action would be like maybe viewing a content or in some of the ed tech space, like booking a, a session with the teacher, right? So don't just say, oh, take an action, right? So, and if you just say take an action, then it would not be very clear to your colleagues, like what does that action mean? The, the action could probably mean, oh, okay, I'm just browsing around in terms of, um, the sessions that are there. I'm not really taking an, I'm just kind of like a casual browser. So just make sure that you're very intentional when defining uh, the key action and always make sure that when you define the key action, it's always relating to if, again, if you take out your app or your web from the ecosystem, what would the person be doing instead, right? So that's, that's a key action that your product is bringing value. Okay, in terms of freight tech, I saw a uh, quote creation, okay, on a week, and on a weekday, uh, and T is, oh, this is the K and T. K, K for quote and N for weekday and T for forwarders, I guess. That's, that's what you're trying to say uh, a while ago. Okay, yeah, financial management, updating school bills, managing. Okay, so all great examples. Right? So I love that um, you're kind of like going through all these examples. I mean, so one thing that I wanted to kind of like further share as well on this slide is that you see this, um, uh, sort of a uh, diagram here that says hourly, daily, and weekly. Yeah? So some of your industries, you would have um, encountered, so example for like things like Cigna, Carta, what the does management in terms of shares, um, not. So some of these apps are actually, their natural frequency are on a yearly or, or monthly or even more than one year basis, right? So. One advice that we tend to give that should your product's natural frequency tends to lean on the monthly, yearly, and X number of years, you may want to also come up with other key actions or key value for the user to bring them back to an hourly, daily, and weekly basis. Because the longer it takes for the user to come back, the higher the chances that they will forget about your app. Yeah, so make sure that you do have that uh, in mind. And so example things like, uh, a booking site, right? So let's say booking.com. Um, if they you know, sort of assume that their users would come back on a bi-yearly basis to kind of like book for a trip or let's say, let's say the target persona is someone who goes on holiday, then that person will probably be coming back to booking.com only on a bi-yearly basis. But on, on, on and off, they will probably send like emails and say, hey, you know, the weather on this island that you went to looks good. Like maybe like check them out, right? Planning in advance for your trip. So they would have other sort of actions or key actions that they want the users to do to bring them back to the app so that 
that user would not totally forget about booking.com so that they would have that still in their mind such that when the time comes that they're going to take their holiday, they would choose booking.com to book their trip. Right? So just take note of that. Um, typically for um, apps that are on hourly, daily and weekly, you don't have that issue because the user is expected to come back on those uh, natural frequencies. But just note that if your app falls into the monthly, yearly and you know, X number of years, you may want to take note of that. Okay. All right. So just continuing here, let's kind of like dive in a bit. We talk about active usage, right? But before the active usage happened, before that natural frequency, before that key action ever happens, you've just acquired your user. They've just gone through a campaign. Let's say they've, they've known about your app through Google or through Facebook or some other campaigns that you have been running. And so they finally went into Google Play Store or you know, Apple App Store to download your app. And then now at the critical moment to say, okay, I now need, I as a user, now have this ask, right? So every user, when they download your app, I, is actually evaluating whether I would want to uninstall this app. Like I have tons of app on my phone and basically every time there's a new app that I need to download, including my own company's app, by the way, which I don't have a choice but to use them. Um, I'm literally going through that thinking process to say, is this product actually for me, right? Does it actually do what I want it to do? And is it easy enough to get what I want, which is the value out of the product that delivers whatever value that may be? Um, and do I actually know how to get what I want? So these are actually kind of the questions that is running through my mind. Is the product for me? Does it do what I want? Is it easy enough to get what I want? And do I know how to get what I want, right? So in order for your users to be able to go through this activation stage, you've got to make sure that they clear all these four hurdles, right? So once again, let me just clear all the drawings here so that it doesn't clutter the screen. And so if you think about activation, essentially it's, it's a process, it's think of it as a funnel step, right? So the best way I could describe it is like a funnel step, but it's literally a process from the moment of acquisition and installing your app or, or going to your website, the user goes through a setup moment, an aha moment and a habit moment. Right. So, and typically when it comes to defining what these uh, moments are in the activation journey, um, we'll try, try to use um, TikTok, which is a very popular um, web or app out there where people who seemingly doesn't create videos suddenly are empowered in their hands to create a video that then puts on TikTok and have gazillions of people like liking it. Right, so it's it's totally revolutionized the entire industry. So let's use that as an example to um, illustrate what does a setup aha uh -huh, and a habit moment means. So, and typically we recommend as you define setup aha uh -huh, and moment, we recommend that you start with the habit moment, right? And the reason why is that habit moment is basically the last process before the user then become engaged, right? Remember our picture that a while ago from reach, you have activation, you have engagement. So habit moment is actually the closest uh, stage before the user become engaged and becomes an engaged user. So what is habit moment? Habit moment essentially tells us that a user is likely to become an engaged user, right? So meaning if you were to break that down, it's Again, correlating it to your value moment, your, the key action that the user is executing, it's literally the number of times that the user has done the core action, which brings value to your product um, that you want them to do for every time period over that very first initial window. And the key here is the initial window, right? Because you want to set the initial window such that from the point that they install your app to the point that they become engaged, right? So let's take a TikTok again as an example. Um, TikTok probably has a habit moment where um, they would define it such that, you know, a user liking a content every four days out of the first 28 days since they have been set up. Yeah. So in TikTok's case, because they are a video, um, you know, they're, they're using, and by the way, just to set some context here, the persona we're talking about TikTok, because TikTok has two personas, right? Um, the people who actually uploads a video and the people who consumes the video. I'm focusing here on the people who actually views the video. So in TikTok's case, 
the moment you install the app and for them, in order for them to be able to get their users to have a habit of coming back to TikTok and view um, you know, the videos again and again, they would want users to like the video. And if you think about it, why in the world, like of all the things, why not is consume video, right? Why not just simply uh, measuring that the user is looking at the video, right? Because if you think about it, by me as a user looking at the video, I as a TikTok product manager, I won't be able to know did the user actually like the video in a way that he will actually want to view a similar video, right? So, so in their case, um, a habit moment could be liking a content uh, after the user has viewed it. And the action of liking essentially is an acknowledgement to say that, oh, Kirby as a user has actually liked this video who has probably someone dancing in front of their bicycle. Right, so, and therefore, the more likes I have for similar videos such as this, the more powerful that TikTok's recommendation engine would be able to drive similar videos, maybe that contains people riding bicycles, cross country trips, you know, using on bicycle, right? So to them, a habit moment could most likely be liking a content um, every four days out of the first 28 days, right? And if you take a step back now, now that, if that is the habit moment for them in order for a user to eventually become engaged, that means if a user has already liked a content for the last, for every four days out of the first 28 days, there is a high chance that they will become an engaged user. And you may ask me, uh, so Kirby, how do I come up with all these magic numbers? Like what's four days? Why must it be four days? Why must it be 28 days, right? So typically, like, the, no one can actually tell you all these magic numbers. And you probably hear that, oh, there's this magic number of Facebook out there, um, four out of five friends uh, being added. But all these magic numbers is something that you would need to measure over time, right? Obviously with not a lot of data, you may need to start off with like a guesstimate, like just to have that a measure. And then as you kind of like adjust that and correlate that habit moment to see out of all your users that say that like every content, between four days or three days or you know, one day out of the first 28 days, how many of those eventually gets engaged? And as you adjust that, that's how you will actually derive that magic number. And you may need to adjust it along the way as your product matures, yeah? So these numbers um, are something that you have to correlate against your engagement by monitoring the data. The more data that you have, the more likely that you'll be able to find out these numbers that suits your product. But in general, um, you know, tend to recommend that when your product is just starting, um, don't be worried about too much about the numbers. Have something that you feel is good enough to just as a start. And then it, as you go along, as you get more data, as you, uh, that you track in terms of your user behavior, correlate that um, X number of days against the different cohorts as they get more and more engaged. And you probably arrive with a sort of a comfortable number, whether should that be three days or should that be four days, okay? All right, so let's say you've defined your habit moment. And let's kind of like look at the aha moment. This is the second step, right? So going back, literally going back to the funnel from habit, how then do we now, now that we know our habit moment is defined this way, how do I get that user from aha to get to habit, right? So aha moment literally is, it's synonymous to the habit moment, except that the fundamental difference here is that the key to aha moment is being able to find or rather the first time that the user is finding value out of your product, right? So it, in its simplistic form, it helps predict a user and to start that developing that habitual behavior, right? So, so it's, if you look at the definition, the, the habit moment is like the number of times a user has done the core action. The aha moment is actually the first number of time the user has done the same core action within the initial period. So let's look at TikTok. In their case, it's again, it's very similar to habit moment. The aha moment will be the first like within the first uh, seven days. So it's the very first time that the user has found value because I've seen a video, I like that. And that period needs to be shorter than your habit moment because what you want to achieve out of the aha moment is essentially the very first time that finally your user has a chance of not uninstalling your app, right? So it's the first time that they found, oh, okay, TikTok, the value is actually, it gives me videos where people are dancing in front of their bicycles. And I like that, right? So that's the first time I found that value. And therefore I may actually have a chance to come back 
in order to build that habit. Okay. So then taking a, another step back, before the user hit that aha moment, what is the setup moment that they need to do? And setup essentially, so a lot of people always ask us, the setup simply means installing the app and, and creating account. Yes and no really depends on, on your product. And, and we'll go through a few examples just to illustrate that. So setup moment um, is actually the leading indicator for, for the user experiencing that first time finding out about the value of your product. And typically I, I tend to say setup moment is, is something that your user has to go through so that they are able to do that first time aha moment, which is the first like in case of TikTok. So in the case of TikTok, they would have defined um, the setup moment as following five users within the first day of sign up. And you may ask, okay, so how, how does that following five users will lead to the first time liking a content um, you know, within the TikTok? But if you kind of like break that down, if I just download a TikTok, um, app and I don't I literally don't follow any users at all. Essentially, I'm randomly viewing any video within TikTok. And as a product manager in TikTok, I wouldn't be able to know in what in the world this user likes at the end of the day. Right. So in a sense, I as a product manager would what I want to do for the user is that they would I would want them to be able to follow at least five users for the first day so that those five users that create content on TikTok. And with that, I probably have a higher chance of them liking a video from those users, which is my aha moment, the very first time I'm liking, and eventually continue to like probably similar videos or other videos um, that you know, these users may actually provide. And therefore, from there, I can then use my recommendation engine to pump in other videos from other users. And hopefully that the same user will actually like those videos as well, thereby increasing more and more habitual um, coming back to TikTok's video, right? So if you break down setup moment, essentially it's, it's the key to say, what are the things that I need from the user or to, to do in order for that user to be able to do the aha moment, which is the first like in this case, right? So in TikTok's case, um, most likely it will be like following five users within the first day of sign up so that there's a chance that they start viewing their video uh, and then you know eventually. So if I were to kind of like, so if you think about all these different steps, right? Essentially in the activation um, sort of flow or uh, process or, or funnel as you would like, this would actually be, you would probably have different um, sort of uh, targeting um, either push notifications or, or pops up in, the, in your app to drive users from the setup moment to the aha moment to the habit moment. And therefore eventually they become engaged. So let's say I am a new user in TikTok and my setup moment is I, I want users to follow five users. So I could have like the moment you install the app, I would say, okay, let's kind of like introduce the top video providers of TikTok um, to this guy. And, and hopefully something would actually get his attention and, and he would start liking one of those videos. So that's kind of like the setup moment. See, like I would probably have notifications. Hey, do you know about that? Um, so I'm based in Singapore. Do you know that in Singapore, uh, there's this guy that is like, you know, he goes around in Singapore riding a bike and whatever. And, and you know, why not you view his video, right? So if I start to follow that user and then eventually and start to view their video, there's a higher chance for me as a user that I would click the first video and, and like it, thereby leading to the aha moment where, oh, you know, now the product manager of TikTok now knows Kirby actually likes uh, videos that are viewed, uh, that have bikes in them. And, and therefore I would then have another targeting when the user hits the aha moment to say, okay, these are the, since Kirby has liked that video, I would now start to introduce other videos to him to in order to drive him to build that habit to keep viewing videos in TikTok. So activation with, with the setup, aha, and habit moment, the reason why they kind of like broke it down into this three step is essentially for each of the steps, you actually have different targeting mechanism to move the user from setup to aha, to habit. And once they've built that habit, eventually uh, they will become engaged and retain users. Okay, I hope that's kind of like breaking down of, of that concept of activation. And to kind of like further illustrate that, um, we do have uh, a couple of, 
you know, other examples like Microsoft Teams, which is uh, basically uh, a lot of companies use that uh, internally and as well as with customers to uh, communicate via chat or via calls. We have booking.com as well, which is a booking um, for travel, let's say. And we have Alipay, which is an e-wallet, all right? So just want to open up to the audience here. And uh, again, in the chat, uh, let's take a look at Microsoft Teams, right? What do you think their habit moment would be knowing that, let's just say chat, right? What, what do you think would be their habit moment? I see invite ex-teammates, okay? Frequent meetings, okay? Sending a chat daily, okay? Right, close. Having meetings every day, okay. Habit number, number group, okay? Like joining the number or creating number of groups, yeah? All right. So all these are good questions, uh, good answers. Set Microsoft Teams as default meeting channel when they send out email invite. As, okay, okay, that's a good one. All right, but we're talking about the habit moment. Yeah, it's not uh, some of these answers that we've given are actually the setup moment. So let's kind of look at the habit moment. Uh, for Microsoft Teams, probably the habit moment would be exchanging at least one message every two days out of the very first seven days from the moment the user has actually been added to Microsoft Teams. So let's, let's kind of like focus on chat. I know some of your answers would be like on the meetings, which is great as well. Uh, let's kind of like focus on the chat part of Microsoft Teams. And remember I said that depending on, on your tool, right? You may have uh, different key actions because uh, that brings value to your users. In case of Microsoft, they have the chat as well as the video. So all great answers that you have there. So as far as the chat is concerned, they will probably have defined habit moment as exchanging at least one message every two days, right? So that you know that the user is collaborating. And the aha moment would probably be three message exchange in the first seven days, right? So the, because the habit of exchanging message via Microsoft Teams as opposed to other channels, then creates that value for the convenience of being able to communicate with your team members, with your colleagues within the app, okay? So some of you have actually answered the, the setup moment. And, and with Microsoft Teams, the setup moment is literally joining channels, right? Because in Microsoft Teams, they're structured in a way where you actually chat in channels. Um, and from there, with if the user doesn't add a channel as a setup moment, the chances that they, they won't be able to exchange messages. And the good uh, sort of the, the power of Teams is not like direct messaging. That's not the value that they bring. The power of team Teams is essentially exchanging a message such that other team members would be able to see that message as well and be able to contribute as well to that conversation. So they would want their users as a setup to join at least five channels within the first three days of login, right? So that they can start exchanging message within those um, different channels. All right, let's take a look at booking.com. And so I'm gonna flash the habit moment first. So this is pretty obvious for booking.com. Um, let's, say, let's, let's say our target persona is someone who goes on holiday, yeah? And the habit moment could be booking at least one trip every six months, right? I mean. I try to go on trips uh, at least once every six months or at least once every year within the first year from them having a booking.com account. Let's say that's a habit moment. Um, opening up to the, the chat here again, what do you think would be the aha moment like if the habit moment is booking at least once, uh, one, one trip every six months within the first year? Okay, first booking. Any other guesses? Or everyone agrees with Jaya here that uh, it's, it's the first booking as the aha moment. More transactions from their booking wallet. Okay, as in like, are, are you talking about more transactions in the sense that more bookings or, or like past bookings? So remember we are talking about activation. This is the first time that the user has had the booking account, right? So we're talking about getting that user um, to the aha, very first moment of finding value. First booking within two months of login, okay? More bookings. Okay, more bookings, I would say, would be like more of the engaged state. Um, success booking after sign up. Okay. Right, you're, you're actually all quite close to the aha moment. Let me share that aha moment that probably they, they would have defined. So in booking.com, they would probably have defined an aha moment as after the first booking, they act, the user actually has given a review that is eight out of 10 within the first six months. 
And taking a step back, think about it. If I'm a user of booking.com and I've set up my account, I booked the first trip, right? And I've gone for my trip within the first six months. Why would booking.com bother to send an email notification to me? And you could actually try this out. I've never tried, I've never uh, booked with booking.com nowadays because nowadays it's so convenient. But in the past, I used to always use booking.com. But why would booking.com bother to send me an email to say, by the way, you, how was your trip, right? Um, can you write us a review? So to them, the value of their platform is not just the convenience of booking, right? Because you can go to any other site like Travelocity or whatever site out there to do a same booking for the same hotel, for the same flight. But to them, an aha moment could be you book the trip, you've gone for that trip within the first six months after your trip come back because they have the, the, your itinerary, right? Let's say you book a flight, you've, you've came back or you've left, you, you kind of like book five nights. You, they know that when you have left that hotel and they send you that, re, that request for a review and they actually want you to be able to rank bookings eight out of 10, meaning that the more ranking that that booking has and that hotel has, the more chances that other people actually book that same hotel and not driving only your own aha moment, but other people's aha moment to see, oh, booking.com is not just a simple booking site that allows me the convenience of booking something, but it's a site that allows me to also get great experiences, right? So that's what they're trying to bring as a value. And it, the setup moment essentially is, you know, like some of you have already said, uh, it's the first night that, that they book within the first month. So that's, 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 that's really a no brainer. So let's talk about Alipay. And uh, most of the people that, you know, some of you may be in the e-wallet industry here, uh, most of the people would know this outright, right? Um, habit moment and aha moment typically is, you know, the, the very first time making a non-peer-to-peer. So P2P sta here stands for peer-to-peer -peer payment um, every week within the first three weeks. Let's say that's the habit moment. And the aha moment is literally like the first non-P2P payment within the five days. So non-P2P could be paying for a bill, uh, if some e-wallet apps like riding a bus, right? So those are non-peer-to-peer. -peer. That means I'm not sending a money uh, to someone else that by just kind of like, you know, using the app to do that, but I'm actually using the app to do other types of payment. So what do you think if the habit moment is uh, doing that non-peer-to-peer -peer payment, what do you think would be the setup moment for e-wallet companies like Alipay? Top up? Very good. Um, Kator, are you in the e-wallet industry? Yeah, adding money. So all of you got it correct, right? So the setup moment would literally be topping the e-wallet within the first three days from um, setting, be it like transferring from a bank account or maybe some e-wallet companies allows you to have um, credit cards that top up to the e-wallet, right? Because without you having any money in there, you won't be able to do any P2P payments at all. So setup, in terms of summarize this whole deck, then the key point here is setup is not just creating an account, right? No, setup is essentially the step of making sure that whatever you need from the person to do the first aha moment, which is the first value that your app brings. So that's why for e-wallet companies, they don't bother about you creating an account. They want you to top up your e-wallet within that X number of days. That's the setup moment. All right. So let's kind of like come to uh, the wrap up of my, um, this uh, sort of whole act explanation about the activation. Um, just kind of like pausing uh, all, by the way, thanks for all the people who's interacting to the chat. Uh, I love the audience here today and, and great uh, responses. So just opening up for a few minutes of questions before we wrap up. Thank you, Kirby. That was very engaging. And thank you to the audience here who actively participated in the chat. So now's your chance if you have any questions that you are reserving along the way for Kirby, um, please put it in the Q&A box and we'll answer them right now. Okay, I think we have some questions in the chat. Um, so Kirby Garima is asking, um, what if the customer doesn't meet the num X number of days of threshold, but comes back to do the activity later, do they still come under the setup moment? When you say threshold, I'm um, just looking at the... Sorry, do you mind repeating that question one more time? If the customers don't meet the number of days of threshold, 
um, for the setup moment, but they come back to do the activity later, do you still consider that a setup moment? Yeah, so I mean, that's the challenge, right? Like, obviously, you expect that user to be doing that setup moment within the X time frame. So I would recommend that don't, I mean, obviously, they will still be part of the setup moment once they've kind of like gone that hurdle. But the goal here is why would you bother to define that threshold, which is the X number of days, is you want to make sure that the moment they installed your app, they created an account, they quickly get that setup moment. Because without doing that, they can't even go to the aha moment, right? So if you don't define that threshold, you practically be like leaving to the user to say, okay, you go and do your thing. I'll wait for you to get that setup moment. Then I'll kind of like engage you. No, right? By the time you want them to do that, they probably uninstalled your app. Hope that answers so what if they your did it? question. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, there's a few people asking whether we will get a recording. So definitely we will be sharing the recording after the session. Um, and we have a few more questions coming in. So Tarun is asking, can you give some examples for B2B activations? Okay. So B2B is something that's very interesting. Like example, Mixed Panel is a B2B um, company where you actually corporate users. So examples of B2B activation would not be looking at, because your B2B company would have purchased your solution, right? So don't look at it as you have already deployed your solution to the company, but activation would be, let's say uh, your SaaS solution, the activation would be the point of your company admin or whatever, setting up those user accounts. Uh, again, I'm not sure which industry you're uh, in, but setting up those user accounts could be one or being able to get those users to actually log in and, and do that key action before they actually derive into doing that core action for, for the hab aha and the habit moment. So activation in terms of B2B company, example, I'm just going to use mixed panel, I guess, um, is not mixed panel selling the solution to the customer, but actually we want the users of mixed panel to, after having set up their account, to start exploring our insights report, right? So that's kind of like set up, like being able to look at, okay, what are the events here? What are the product? So that's activation so that they can start using the reports and finding value out of their data. Okay, thank you, Kirby. Um, we have another question from Indrani. So besides the, the product itself, what is the role of CRM, I mean, customer communications for activation? Do you think it's more or less important? You mean as a CRM tool to communicate to, I'm, I'm going to assume that the CRM tool communicating to the user um, yeah. as, a, as a tool to communicate. To like a customer engagement messaging. Okay. Yeah, I think um, those would probably, you're probably thinking along the line of how do you send messages to your users to get them to activate? That's I'm guessing that the question is coming from. Um, yeah, I mean, CRM is pretty important in the way where if you do send your aha and habit moment into your uh, CRM solution to kind of like monitor that, yes, I would say that that would play a part. Um, obviously, um, being mixed panel and shamelessly plugging here, uh, mixed panel kind of like provides that better analysis in terms of from your aha moment to your setup aha and, and uh, sort of uh, this um, habit moment. But yeah, I mean, CRM does play a part in terms of being able to at least track that what are the key moments that you want the user um, to be in, whether it's set up uh -huh, or, or habit moment. Okay, let's go to the next question. So for a platform business that is facing both the consumer and the supplier, is there any recommendations on how the activation should be done and should these two parties' interactions be part of the setup moment? Yeah, so those are two personas, right? So you would need to have separate um, setup moments because they are very different. Your consumer and your supplier are very two different persona. Always remember that your core action and your natural frequency would depend on your personas, right? So um, if you're a platform that is dealing with two types of persona, then you should have separate setup, aha, and habit moments for those two uh, targeted personas. Okay, and I think um, that's all the questions that um, came in 
from the Q&A box. So thank you so much for all your questions. Uh, before we conclude this webinar, there are just some additional resources that I would like to share with everyone. Um, so before I go into it, I'll just put it in the chat um, so that you can assess all the links. So firstly, we do have some freebies and goodies for all of you. If um, any one of you don't yet have a product analytics tool and you are um, looking to get started, you can actually sign up for a free mixed panel account and then access some of the key reports to start measuring your product and activation metrics. We also have a free product analytics certification course and it's open to everyone. So you can um, try and get a certification. We also have a couple of eBooks that will be very useful reading materials for anyone looking at um, starting or reviewing their analytics strategy. Um, it's about product analytics as well as um, product metrics. And beyond these goodies, um, I would also like to just share a bit about some of the upcoming events that we have. So if you've enjoyed our masterclass today, you might be interested to attend some of our upcoming events. If you're looking at exploring Mixpanel or if you're new to Mixpanel, we do interactive demos every two weeks and the next live demo would be next Tuesday on the 18th January. So feel free to join us. We also have another event in the following week. It's a fireside chat with one of our customers, Sign Easy, about how to boost activation for SaaS. So this is super relevant to our topic today. If you're interested in getting more into activation, or if you are part of like a SaaS, the SaaS industry, you might be interested to join. This is hosted by our Indonesian product community partners, but the whole session will be conducted in English. So feel free to attend if you're interested. And last but not least, um, rounding up to the end of the month, um, for anyone who is currently implementing Mixpanel or thinking of getting started and implementing Mixpanel, we'll be running through a, a webinar to run how you can um, better do identity management on your Mixpanel account. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today in this session. I hope that it was useful for everyone that attended and I hope to see you in one of our upcoming events. And thank you so much, Kirby. Thank you, everyone. Glad that session Have was a helpful. Good day. Okay, Bye -bye. see you. Take care.